beautiful day. I love this weather. It's uh, amazing. I was here uh, in 1985. Not here, but in Worcester. And uh, it's interesting because I was a young guy that uh, was competing in the first world championship. Um, and uh, I made third. And you know when, when you, a, a happy event happened to you, you start connecting all the things that go along with it, you know, the people, the trees, everything. And so when I came last night, as soon as I got out of the airport, I felt the same way I felt, what, 15 years ago? It's amazing. It's like time doesn't exist. I was not all, always a, 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 I was not born with the ability and the gift to become Mr. Universe. Uh, far from it. When I was 19 years old, I weighed 108 pounds. All of my sisters were basically bigger than, than me. Uh, low self-esteem, poor. When you have, when you think you have a low, low esteem, is you're projecting this upon others. So my thing was, I'm skinny, you can beat me up. Um, all the lunch uh, boxes that my mom was preparing, I really never had one because I would automatically deliver them to the bullies. On certain days, I would go back with home with one shoe without a jacket. Um, certain instances, I would be you know, put in a in the bathroom, they'll close the door and they tell me not to move. I would stay there for eight hours, seven, eight hours, until the janitor finds me. All the good things that uh, a kid with low self-esteem would go through. So I decided to protect myself. And I developed a ritual, a crying ritual. After school, I go home go to my room, which I was uh, um, sharing with seven or eight other siblings, I would sit there and it, it's like someone was telling me deep inside of me, your only option is to cry until you m remove all that stress that you've been through the day. So I would cry, cry. It would last 10 minutes, 20 minutes. And I would go play with my siblings and feel great about myself. The only moments I felt great about myself is when I was with my siblings, my sisters and brothers. So that was a ritual that uh, I really never gave up that ritual. It's also called meditation. I didn't know I was meditating. I really didn't know, but it required for me to go within. I was crying for five, ten minutes. I would think about how poor my low self-esteem was, how I was, uh, you know, uh, sadness in general. But then it, it, it took a life in its own. It became meditative. One day, I came back home. I was about to go to do my ritual. Everybody was watching a program on television. I remember all my life. This is what changed my life. I walk in the house, drop my bag, and see that everybody's watching this program, and this guy on TV is doing the Iron Cross. Perfect body, a gymnast. Perfect body. What was I subconsciously asking myself all along? Why am I not healthier? Why am I not bigger? Why don't I have a girlfriend like everyone else? 19 years old, no girlfriend. That's a problem. I have a five-year-old boy. He's got two girlfriends. <laughs> and the answer was right in front of me. I looked at this guy, and I fell in love. I'm going to write it down there. Fell in love. 
If it's not correct, please correct me. I'm French. So, when I fell in love, what happened? What do you do when you fall in love with someone? Don't tell me you never fell in love because I don't believe you. What happened? You become stupid. <laughs> you become so stupid that you'll do everything it takes to be with the person you love. Everything it takes to be with the person you love. Why is that so? We forgot that we had a guidance process. That all the questions we have, we have an answer. If only we went back in here to get the answer. When I saw that gymnast, I asked myself, why not me? And the answer was an excitement. There's two feelings we can feel, right? Don't tell me there's two million feelings. I don't believe it. There's two feelings. One, you feel good, which is excitement. Two, you feel bad, which is anxiety. What happened when I saw this gentleman? I felt an amazing excitement. When you feel an excitement, it's so powerful you have a desire. It's not just a desire, but a true core desire. A true core desire. I won't trick you a bit. <laughs> true core desire. You see with your eyes or your brain? With your brain. We don't see with our eyes. The eyes are connected to the brain, and then the information is filtered by the subconscious mind. So what happened is that I immediately, I saw the picture, it went into my brain, and it mingled with the information there. The sadness, the, the low self-esteem, and the answer was, yes, I can't become like that. So what happened when you fall in love with somebody? You anchor the information from the subconscious to the, from the conscious to the subconscious. It takes usually a while to do that. But when you fall in love and you have a true core desire, it happened instantly. When you have that, you know what happened? You start behaving in a way that is leading you to directly to your goal. If only you keep the image of that desire in the screen of your mind. Now, I want to become like this. What do I do? So I start going to the library. I start asking questions. Next thing I know, I find out myself getting a membership at a gymnastic club. Okay? That's called an, a, a, an appropriate plan, right? only to find myself breaking all kind of bones. I was 109 pounds. What do you do in a gymnastic club at 109 pounds? They make you jump right, left, you know, and before you know it, you know, and I was hurt and won't tell them because I want to belong. You know, I had that picture. I broke my wrist in competition. I didn't want to tell nobody because I want to see to become like that gentleman. Until my coach really uh, saved my life, came to see me, said, you know what? You're going to kill yourself. You better stop this. You need to put some meat on you. Go to a gymnast or a, uh, a um, weightlifting club. Here's an address. So the next day I end up going to the, to the club. I remember I have uh, three francs and I took the bus to, to go to there and I didn't have money to go back so I had to walk back. But I got to the gym and... Uh, this gentleman was working out, and it was probably where the tables are. And he dropped the bar. 
he comes towards me, and as he was walking towards me, he was bigger and bigger <laughs> and bigger. It scared the hell out of me. So I ran away. What happened? I was not focused on the image. I went off the path. I got ego and fear involved. It took me away from my core desire. Only to find myself at home doing my ritual again. Which led me to the courage to go back the next day. See what I'm talking about? You get back that image, you get back on track, and you try it again. Right? I went there and he went from the back and got me. Put on his, shoulder, his hand on my shoulder. I turned and I was like, oh! and he said, calm down. What are you afraid of? I said, I don't want to become like you. He says, you're never going to become like me. I said, I don't want. He says, do you want to join the club? And I said, how much is it? And he told me the price, and I was sad because I really I couldn't afford it. He said, okay, here's a card. Go get pictures done. At that time, we have the, we call it photomaton, which is a, you know, a place where you're going to, we still have them now. Get in there, you put a few francs and you get the pictures done. And he says, I'm giving you one year for free. His name is Michel Dermot. I remember all my life. So I started. And as I was keeping that image, I would do good. And when there was people that reminded me of my bullies, I would have a horrible session. So example, people were working out, big guys, and they're sitting on the machine doing nothing. And I would wait. Back then, I was Mr. Puniverse. <laughs> so I would hide until they're done with the machine. That would m meant like 10, 15 minutes. So it would take me to do three sets. It would take me two hours, right? Then I had enough of, of this. you know. And I said to myself, working out is not the only thing that is important. Hence, I was doing the most important thing, by the way, this. But I was forgetting about a big thing, nutrition. So I went to study nutrition. And I studied at the library because my school, were, they didn't care about nutrition or exercise. So I self-educated myself in terms of nutrition. Within three years, I became Mr. France, Mr. Europe, and Mr. World, and Mr. Universe. I protected myself. You know, all of a sudden, I was this recognized guy, you know, famous everywhere. I traveled around the world for years, picked up five languages, met fantastic people. But I was unhappy. I locked myself in the body obsession. Something as horrible as being obese. I was not happy with who I became. So, in search of an answer to my question, it took a couple years, I moved to the States and I met, I met a wonderful gentleman in the name of Dr. Dharma Singh Kalsa. He's the author of eight books. One of the, his uh, famous work called The Brain Longevity. And he's also a master teacher of yoga, kundalini yoga. I was working out one day, and this guy overheard me speaking French. So he comes, and he's got a turban and all that. I'm like, who the hell is this guy? He comes and says, bonjour, bonjour. And so I started speaking French, and he didn't speak at all. He kept quiet. And I said, what happened? You don't speak French now? And he says, well, a little bit. And he said, I'm going to Paris with my wife. She's Italian. Can you give me a name of a restaurant? Or I gave him a name of a restaurant, and I gave him my phone number. He came back. A month later, he called me. He wanted me to train him. At that time, I was a personal trainer. 
So I trained him and he said, we're going to trade, if you don't mind. I'm going to teach you meditation and you're going to teach me working out. How does that work? I said, okay, good. For 40 days, I was miserable. I was going through so much anxiety after meditation. Well, every time I call him, he'll laugh at me. And I said, well, why are you laughing? He says, you're cleaning yourself up. What do you think? You were a diamond before or what? You're cleaning yourself up, and you have to keep doing it. It's the best thing I've done in my life. What is meditation? It's not a miracle thing. Meditation widens your state of awareness. That's all it does. So it can connect directly to the subconscious mind and get information. So it helps you to get the, the subconscious to the conscious. So you make better choices in your life. So instead, so I, I used to you know, make errors right away. You know? After meditation, slowly but surely, I would like, you know, make an error and be aware that I made an error and think, oh, that's not, that's not right. Next time I won't do it. The more I went on the meditation, I found myself seeing the error right there before I even do it. So your state of awareness gets wider. So what happened when I got to become more of me instead of be there for others? I started self-respecting myself, not thinking that a nice body was everything. But thinking rather, if I do love myself and respect myself, automatically I'm projecting upon others to do just that. So from the obsession, I went on to becoming more of me. So immediately after that, I decided that my mission should be to take all my knowledge. So if I became Mr. Universe from a ricket baby, I can teach people the process in their life, whether they, be, they want to become Miss or Mr. Universe or become the CEO of a company. It's the same process. First, you have to identify your true core desire. Because if you can't see it, you can't have it. How can you have something if you can't see it? You can't. Power of intention. OK. I, I swear, I didn't uh, copy uh, Dr. <laughs> Wayne Dyer. My book was written actually two years before this last June, so uh, just believe me. And nor did I follow the secret. <laughs> okay, everything was written before, and I can prove that. What is the power of intention? All right. Somebody walking on a treadmill, and their intention is, and the value of themselves is, I want to be fit. I want to lose weight. And they're eating a snicker bar. <laughs> Does the value of themselves and the action or behavior matching? That's what I call the power of intention. When you intend something, act. Match your intention with your behavior. What is my intention? How do I need to behave to match that intention? Very important. Now, once you have identified your true core desire, using your power of intention, now you need something else. You need to create an action plan. Guess what? People that think about the how are wrong. People that think about the what are right. Because when you get the what, you'll find the how. 
When you get the what, you'll find the how. After I fell in love with that body, what happened? You think I knew what to do? No, I automatically behave in a way that led me to people and to things that would help me achieve my core desire. The universe is creating all that for you. Why? Because you're thinking that which you want. Every single thing, including this chair, came from a thought, right? It's a three-part process. First, you must think. Then you must feel. Then you will act. Only then you'll create. So the person who created this had the thought, got emotionally involved with it, that changed his behavior, and started finding the how. First off, how do a core desire come upon you? It's given to you by nature. It comes from everywhere. Nature is very friendly to human. If you don't feel core desire, a strong core desire, it means that there are other issues you need to take care of first. Okay, so once you get your power of intention, your core desire, power of intention, you need a third element. Would it help if I wrote it down here, identify? True core desire. And third, make it a, a appropriate Action plan. The fourth one is use the power of your resolve. It's one thing that you make the plan, but if you don't consciously make the choice to do it, it's not going to happen. When people say, I want to lose weight, do you think it's enough? We know how to exercise, we know how to eat, we know how to breathe. Why are we not doing it? The part of the brain that knows is not the same part of the brain that does. It's two different things. So I'm going to ask you the question, where is the part that knows? Is it the conscious or the subconscious? Conscious data. Where is the part that does? Subconscious. What do you need to do in order to get to the subconscious? You have to build new ways. The conscious mind processes 2,000 bits of information per second. The subconscious mind processes, do you know how many? Anyone knows? Four billion bits of info per second. Who do you think is, is stronger? <laughs> you get sufficient say, oh, I'm going to start a diet. It doesn't work that way, right? Other celebrities or to speak overall people that come from Yerva, they all have the same question. I want to lose this. You know, they tell you they want this. But in, in, in reality, they focus on what they truly don't want. The traditional fitness world has failed. Period. Okay? After seeing all these people coming to me, I had to ask myself, am I failing them or are they failing themselves? No one was to be blamed. I had to just reframe myself and reframe the way I was thinking and say to myself, hey, you know what? Why don't I go deep down in the brain and try to find out what's going on there? Maybe learn a little bit of neuroscience and see what's going on. Then I found out that, hey, if the brain, if, if the conscious mind processes this, this much of information and the subconscious this much, they're powerless. We are powerless. 
unless we consciously choose to take the data and transfer it in the subconscious mind by doing it and hence being it. You have to be fitness, not do fitness. Human being is very strange that way. When we say to someone that a particular thing needs effort, all of a sudden we're not interested anymore. Right? We're not. That's because we don't like effort. But when we, when we say become which you want, then things change. I was sitting with Deepak Chopra in San Diego one day. And he said, Nordin, do you get this problem where you tell people, be, just be? And they say, well, I don't have to do anything. Just be, and things will come to me. In reality, what we mean is, if you are what you want to do, there is no effort. You will enjoy the process. You understand what I'm trying to say? Be fitness. So I had to change all my learning because you go to the American College of Sports Medicine, you go to all this institution, and what you told is everything physical. Now, although they're changing their way by applying some behavior, behavioral change modification, but it's not enough. As a practitioner, you get frustrated. When you're in Miraval, it's all good and you know, fantastic. Seven days later, you go home. Three days later, you go back to your environment. You don't want to apply it. Let's design a, well, let's write it down here. Use the power of your resolve to make it automatic. What stress create? Cortisol. What does cortisol have, does? Cortisol is now re directly related to Alzheimer's disease, to a heart disease. Okay, what cortisol level? What what do we have? The cortisol level is a hormone triggered by the adrenaline, and why do we have this? Because we need to be prepared for a fight and flight response. Back then we needed it a hundred years ago because we had to hunt to live, right? Now in the office we have we're running out of, from the tiger being behind the computer. It doesn't make sense, right? But the process inside is the same. So it, what it does, it takes the fat and as a safety process and store it for you to use it. But we're not using it anymore. So it builds it around the organs. At Miraval, I used to go behind the offices and look at the, the person who comes with their big coffee, you know, and and like a Krispy Kreme donuts, mm -hmm. and they go behind the computer. So I come back half hour later, and yes, they're sleeping. <laughs> you know what I mean? So I had to study all this to understand that. How do we understand our clients if we don't really put ourselves in their shoes? Demand, stress, lack of education in terms of health and fitness, all contribute to make them not only overweight, but sick. This is the key. And it's so easy. Wake up, what time? When you wake up. Thank you. What do you do? No, breathe. <laughs> don't jump out of your bed if you don't have to. Because I found that, you know, if you get out, you start thinking. If you move too much, you start thinking. So get in your bed, put your bed against the, the wall or whatever, and breathe. Or 
meditate. I don't like to say, tell people meditate because it's something you choose to do. Okay? So you meditate, you breathe. Okay? So let's call it take time for yourself. How long do you think? Start with three minutes. If you never did it before, it's going to feel like it's a lifetime. And then build it up. Okay, start with three minutes. Okay, build it up to 20 minutes. Okay, and then have a what? If you are a morning exerciser, let's take two modalities. There's many types of exercise. So I'm going to take two modalities, strength training and cardiovascular. Why? Because they're, you know, directly responsible for metabolism and, and other good benefits. So if you're doing your workout in the morning, then have, and you're doing strength and cardio together, then have a light snack, something to hold you up. Then work out. Okay? So work out. Okay? So when you work out, what do you do first? Cardio or strength? <laughs> I love this. If you're trying to lose weight, tone muscles, you better do strength first. Warm up first and then strength first. Why? Because when you do cardio, you get rid of what? So you're using as, a, as an energy what? ATP and glycogen. Okay, when you wake up in the morning, you have depleted your glycogen level. So if you get rid of the remaining glycogen, what happened? You do strength, uh, if you burn fat, yes. But once you're done with your cardio session, you don't have any more glycogen. When you do your strength, you're using glycogen. You're not using fatty acid because you're in an anaerobic zone. So you tap into your muscles. It's called catabolism. So it defeats the purpose. Okay? So have something light, because if they work out on an empty stomach, it's not good. After the workout, I strongly suggest you get a meal, breakfast. Why? Because that's the time where your organism needs the, the most. Okay, so have breakfast. Then go on with your day. However, Make sure that you're not going over three to four hours. And then in the book, I, I have what I call a, a, a mindful eating uh, hunger scale, which tells us when it's appropriate to eat and when it's not appropriate to eat. And when your body starts slowing down or your metabolism starts slowing down. When you reach five hours, that's when you are in starvation mood and you know what happened. You start making your own fat for safety. So don't go to the five hours. And generally, what happens is that you start being frustrated. You get uh, uh, hungry after three hours you start being hungry. That is, if you didn't overload yourself with coffee or other stimulants. And if you pass that three hours, you start being frustrated. Then you get to five hours, you're angry. Okay. Then you're out of this world after that. So the idea is to eat. And when I said, as I mentioned earlier, a meal, a snack, should have as much nu nutrient as a meal. Why? Because you actually take in your day, um, your calorie requirement. In Mind Over Body, I have a, a perfect formula for you to, to identify that. And what you do, your total calories are divided by the number of calories you need for your carbs, protein, and fat, and divided by five meals. Okay, you can start with four meals, and optimally, five meals would be most beneficial. Um, we do that to maintain the blood sugar to a adequate level, instead of doing the yo-yo dance with our blood sugar. 
One, one minute we smiling, the other we pulling our hair. So the, and, and believe me, 60% of the equation is nutrition in whatever you do. Okay, first the mind. But 60% is nutrition. The workout is a very little, uh, tiny part of the equation. Nutrition is the most important one. So make sure that every three hours, and in Mind Over Body as well, we have a typical, like optimal day. So it tells you, you know, when. But every three hours, you got a meal or snack. Five meals a day. Now, if you are a person that works out in the evening, again, if you can promise me that you can go home and do it, I believe you, that's fine. But most likely you won't do it. Go to the gym. Um, what are the benefits of going to the gym? There are other energies there. If you go to a lazy gym, you'll be lazy. It's true. If you go to a gym where people are working out and they have the same goal and they want to, hence, if you can find somebody who has the same like, t you know, type of body and has the same goal and have the time to work out with you, it's perfect partner. Okay? You save money. Other things that I like about the gym is that the environment, you know, um, if you didn't eat, you can get something there like a protein shake. So you don't have to stop at a, a joint where they have no protein shake. Everything is, a, is not so good for you. So gym, usually, if you go to a decent one, they have protein shakes or bars and everything else. So you can get it right there. Um, so do it in the evening only if you know that you can go from work to the gym. And the way I do this is I take a phone book and locate the different gyms and, lo and locate my place of work and make sure that it's not going to take more than a half hour to get there because chances are you're going to go back, okay, close to your workplace, okay. Then when you get home, make sure that you're not going to go sleep right away after you eat the meal, okay. Wait two, two, two hours. If you wait more than that, you need to eat. Why? First off, you can't sleep well when you're hungry. Two, you're not dead when, you, when you're sleeping. Your metabolism's still working. So you need to feed that machine. It's a way to call it a machine. We are made to burn calories. We are made to move. The less you move, the less growth there is. Okay? A moving person is a live person. If a person is going through a mental, um, a mental issue like depression and everything else, I'd strongly recommend that if you know somebody like that, not only do they have therapy, but that you push them to be active. Because in their mind, they are in a safety zone. What is this part called? The reptilian? Reptilian brain. Under stress, what the reptile does? Closes itself. This is a mammalian brain. It does the same thing if this one is under stress. They both go into, this one goes for uh, physical safety and the mammalian brain for um, emotional safety. When these are like this, under stress, Conscious, subconscious, they're normally crossed. They turn their back to each other. 
There's no more creativity or very low creativity uh, going on. So that's why a depressed person would feel like they don't want to do anything. And so they, they stay in safety mode. That's, that's all they, they know. They have to stay that way. The idea is to push them to be more active, get the blood flow going into their brain so they can enjoy and see that there is a bright sight in their lives. And exercise really does reduce anxiety, as you may well know. Uh, again, exercise alone is not enough for depression. But uh, I like to call it this way, and the medical uh, institution uh, may very well be uh, against it, but I like to call it the depression is a lack of energy, as you deplete your energy. To me, that's the way I see it. So in order to get that back to life, you need to get moving. You know, get moving. Even if you're tired, just get moving. You know, go for a walk. The couch is your enemy. Right? So, now, um, is there any questions about everything that's been said the last couple of hours? What did you say about uh, you should Yeah. You know, my colleagues, there's a debate about this. Some say three hours, some say two hours. What I found out is that when you're hungry, it's really hard to have a, night, a good night's sleep. And when you wake up in the morning, you're starving, and it's, it's, it's really, it can snowball on you. So make sure that you have something, you know. And when I say something, it this doesn't mean a burger. Here's the deal. If you follow the, 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 the scale that I have in the book, that five hours, and follow it, you're going to really switch or rectify what's going, what's going on. If you have any issues in terms of staying too long without eating, you will. What I've found out throughout the years is that when I've done that after a few months, is that my body would, at the minute I needed to eat, it would let me know. So if you're hungry, it's because you're hungry. Hence, if you're hungry, it's because probably you needed to, to be eating half hour ago. Not eating is not a good idea. Not eating will slow your metabolism. Not eating, what is the brain works on? And fat. You know? Look at Oprah. Okay? How many times did she have to go through yo-yo diets and, and all that? She has a high-stressed life. Okay? And she also goes through, you know, despite Bob Green. You know, Bob Green is just a part of the equation. It's not everything. It's Oprah, the Bob Green, that she needs, not Bob Green. So sometimes she goes without eating, and that slows down in her metabolism, and then she gains the weight, and then, you know, all of those things that we need to, it's simple. If we follow it, what, what's, the, what's the issue? How, if you got the right mindset and your body follows and you have the tools, what can go wrong? Unless you really get sick, you know, which is really rare. What can, can go wrong, really? Nothing. Somebody told me where well, I go, I travel, you know, it's full of McDonald's, Burger Kings, and I have to eat this. No, wrong. You have to eat this. Watch yourself talking. The body is the servant of the mind. Whatever you tell it, it will do. Go to McDonald's and say, I want a chicken breast and the whole wheat um, buns. They have that. Or have your zone bar or whatever in your bag. Or go get Ziploc bag. They just came out. I don't know if it's a new thing or not. The other day, my, my wife made a, this you know, revolutionary uh, discovery. She said, oh my god, i got to show you something. <gasps> You're going to love it. And I was like, what the hell? She says, look, sit down. I said, OK. I thought it was a present for me, but it's not. Well, somehow it's a present. She goes. She opens the pantry. She gets a bag. She cuts sweet potatoes, chicken, 
broccoli, spice it up, put it in the bag, put it in the microwave. Five minutes later, she serves it to me. Amazing. <laughs> How long did it take? Five minutes. Five minutes. How long did it take for her to prepare it? Not even. How long does it take to prepare five of those? Half an hour. <laughs> How long does it take for you to go for, to the restaurant, wait, and eat crap? Two hours for one meal. And you spent 20 bucks. You just spent 50 cents or a dollar on that thing. <laughs> we have no excuse. Old conditioning. Remember? 2,000 bits, 4 billion bits. So it's actually this one talking, not this one. It's very simple to be in total shape and health, period. But the things we need to get to, is this. So what are you going to do with yourself, your clients, your patients? Look at them with your heart, not with your eyes. Look at them with your heart, not with your knowledge. I'm going to repeat this. Look at them with your heart, not with your eyes. Look at them with your heart, not with your knowledge. Knowledge comes later. Give them the data first. Wrong. Why? You need to have them open their heart first. Then give them the data. Why? Because they're going to assimilate it better. If you scare them to hell with data right away, they're going to close and they're going to be like this. When you put somebody at ease, anxiety cannot reside. I'm going to tell you one thing. How many of you read Eckhart Tolle? Okay. When he says, fear cannot reside in the present, or in the, in the present. It resides either in the past or in the future. You have to bring them in the now. Because you know what? Remember that four billion? It's working. You need to come bring them back here now. So have them breathe. Do a three minute breathing process. All my clients, you know, some, some of them, they freak when they go, okay, I want to lose weight. Calm down. Okay? Calm down. Relax. Relax. Breathe. Hold it. Exhale. Now close your eyes. Breathe. I see you shaking. Just relax. Just relax. Help them. These people, perhaps, they never relaxed in their life. They, they, they learn how to, to come to you and look for a miracle pill. In reality, people are not interested most of the time until you make them aware of it. They're not interested in healing. They're interested in the pill. So the, the way they look at us, pay, uh, our uh, practitioners, coach, we have a badge for them. And it's called, and it says, give me a pill. That's the way they look at us. But when we show them our real face and who we are, truly, and get them to meet us halfway, or you meet them halfway, that's it. It's 50%. You know, there's a saying, and I'm sure you heard of the saying, 50% of successes show up, right? In this case, it's 50% if it's bring them to the now. It's going to be so much easier. Your work is so much. Of course, at Miraval, you know, it's easier for me because they go to other, you know, uh, programs. Like a, there's a, a program called the Equ Equine Experience, which is really healing. So they come and they have a smile. But if they come to see me first, it's oh my nightmare. So what I do is I, I just get back to, you know, I don't think about this woman is such and such. If I screw up, 
my butt is on the line, I can lose my job. I don't think that way. I used to. Now I think about she is just like me and everyone else. So just meet halfway and bring them into the... Now, don't be afraid. So this lady told me, well, there's no fear in the now? No. What do you mean? If I'm in a plane, how do you explain this? I start shaking when it, there's turbulence. It's the now. I said, no, it's not the now. What do you mean? You're thinking about crashing. <laughs> the plane didn't crash yet. And you're like this. Get back in the now. So remember, these people, they come, they in the, they're stuck in one zone. Fight and flight response. Get them back to now. And they'll feel much more comfortable. And they, the information will sink in. Me, it's worse. Sometimes it's worse. The person says, I don't like to work out. I don't like to eat well. And I'm stressed out. What can I do? <laughs> By the way, the CEO called me 10 minutes before she gets in the office. Tell me, OK, do your job. Can you imagine the stress that is all of a sudden in here? I don't listen to all that. Because I know that there's another conversation over here. The real conversation. Habits. Habits. You know, a habit, we get a certain joy doing the things we do. Otherwise, it wouldn't be habit. Whether they're bad or good. So the key is to find another thing that is positive that gives us as much joy. If the, 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 the gallon of ice cream uh, uh, <laughs> watching TV makes us feel good and then half hour later we feel like hell, you know, we need to find a way we can have as much joy while we're doing it that doesn't make us feel like hell half hour later. Mind over body has a, a, a fantastic process in there as a result of my own life and uh, experience and uh, a knowledge that I picked up along the way, which, by the way, is a process of commitment. So it's not seven days to buns of steel. Okay, so people at first, they're not going to grab it because they're not committed. You know who's going to grab it? the person that tried everything and failed. Thank you. If you have books that I need to uh, sign.